Cairo, Seattle. is your last meal. I'm your host, Rachel Bell, and each episode I interview a celebrity about what they would choose to eat for their last meal. Then we explore the history of that food, the culture, and whatever else we can cram into 30 minutes. Today on the program, Jackson Galaxy. I am the cat daddy. Did you name yourself the cat daddy? I did. (laughs) I just think that's funny. Jackson Galaxy is a cat behaviorist. Is it behaviorist? Behavist. (laughs) Oh, behaviorist. Jackson Galaxy is a cat behaviorist and host of the Animal Planet show, My Cat from Hell, where he goes into people's houses to tame their crazy kitties. My cat attacked our uh, seven-month-old child, and we're trapped in our bedroom. He won't let us out of our door. He's really bad right now. He's he's charging us. He hit our door, our bedroom door. One moment, okay? (laughs) In case you've never encountered me walking down a street and having to stop to pet every single cat that's in my path, you may not know that I'm a crazy cat lady, a term which I actually resent. There is nothing wrong with loving cats and not having a boyfriend. Anyway, <laughs> turns out Jackson and I love talking about the same things. I like to talk about food, and I like to talk about cats. What about cat food? I, I love to talk <laughs> about cat food. I love talking about cat food more than I love talking about anything else. Later in the show, we'll learn all about the fascinating Beyond Burger. This is a 100% plant-based burger pretending to be meat. I've heard and read that when you take a bite of this burger, it bleeds just like real meat. Something very simple, beet juice. And a topic very close to my heart, Jewish deli. Corned beef, pastrami, matzo ball soup, knishes, and hot dogs. We'll talk about the sad, slow death of Jewish delicatessen in America with David Sachs, author of the book, Save the Deli. But first, Jackson Galaxy, formerly Richard Kirchner. So why did you change your name? Because it was cool. Here was the deal. So I've been a musician longer than I've been anything else. And I started playing when I was 10. I got my first real guitar at 12, named the guitar Jackson when I was 12. And I used that guitar to gig with up until only about seven, eight, nine years ago. The thing just finally turned to dust. So I was designing the cover for this tape. And my friend, who's a great artist, he drew my guitar floating through space with planets and stars. And we named the tape Jackson Galaxy. And a couple weeks later, when I released it and I put it out there, someone looked at it and they go, my God, that should be your name. And I was like, done. Fine. Did you not like your other name? It, it, was, it came off the tongue in a very awkward, mushy way. And Jackson Galaxy rolls off the tongue like a son of a gun. And I just kept it. The problem was Jackson wasn't making money as a musician. And he was tired of service jobs. So when he saw a job in the paper for an adoption counselor at a cat shelter, he took it. Jackson says he's never had a cat before. He grew up with dogs. So he was kind of surprised to learn that he's a cat whisperer. All the cats seem to be naturally gravitating towards him at the shelter. And at that time, shelters were euthanizing the cats. He did not work at a no-kill shelter. So he realized that if he could figure out how to make the bad behaved cats good, he could get them adopted and save all kinds of kitty lives. People try to see cats through dog-colored glasses. And other than the fact that they got four legs most of the time and they live under your roof, that's where it all stops. So I think people expect cats to interact with humans and other animals in a much more socialized way. They're not. They're barely domesticated animals. Barely. In fact, I don't even consider them domesticated. So you have to meet them halfway. Then, you know, you start to realize... No, the cat's not peeing in your shoes just because they hate you. You know, that's what we want to reduce it to. They just look at you blankly and you go, what? You know, why do you hate me? And until about maybe 120 years ago, where Queen Victoria was a cat lover and she was the first to bring cats into her home, that's 120 years ago. Hmm. And the evolutionary picture, that's like a drop in the bucket. Now we get mad when they won't poop in a box. We get mad when they scratch our curtains. My cat is still a very good murderer. I call her the most adorable murderer in the world. This week alone brought one mouse in that she batted around in the kitchen half alive, literally blood spraying. 
oh, out of it. Oh, so gross. Oh, that's so gross. So gross. I don't know. I'm just telling you this because I'm sure you've heard and seen so much oh, worse. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then the next day, I open the door, and on the mat is just like guts from another mm-hmm. animal. It's been a good week for Yummy. Poppy. Yeah, yeah but she's really sweet otherwise. She's nice to me, Poppy. Oh, they said puppy. I was like, puppy. cat's not a dog. I know. What did I just say? <laughs> <laughs> cats are pretty divisive. There are people like me who love cats going on vacation tonight. I miss my little puppy already. I'm going on a hiking trip, and I've been imagining her wearing four tiny little hiking shoes. Uh, but there are people who don't have images of cats and shoes in their minds, and those are people who hate cats. These are people I like to call dog people. And it seems like dog people don't like cats because cats are unpredictable. They may not come when you call. They may not sit on your lap. They may get violent without warning. Uh, But it turns out the way to make cats sweeter and happier and more people friendly is actually to allow them to be more wild. I have this whole approach to cats. I call it cat mojo. It's when, when a cat is just at the height of confidence, they have this swagger to them and and, and that swagger has tail positions to it and ear positions. Cats get that swagger based on their degree of ownership of territory. So territory is everything to cats. And if they feel like it's being threatened by human, animal, just contraction in general, whatever it is, that's when you're going to start seeing them act out. So a lot of what I do is based on confident ownership of territory. And it's also like Poppy. Poppy is probably a mojo-rific cat because she hunts because she's connected to her ancestors on a daily basis. So let's just say that your cat's not Poppy and you don't have a you know, multitude of guts hanging out. You, you know, cat play is about that. I think everybody who has a cat needs to invest 5, 10, 15 minutes a day in interactive play where you're pretending to be prey and they're, they're not pretending to be a predator. And that kind of play is going to lead to a confident cat. And then you're going to head off so many of the problems that we see at the pass. How many cats do you have? Oh, God. The ultimate question. Yeah, well, okay, so it's it's a little tricky. Um, so we have five indoor house cats. We also have a, our feral family. We have three cats who live in our garage, and we have a catio. And then we have another two or three that uh, we can't catch yet, but we consider them family as well. So a lot of mouths to feed and three dogs and... Um, a box turtle named Sammy. So this we, is why you have to work so hard hell to yeah. feed all the cats hell and dogs yes, and turtles. Man, it's not it's not a cheap way of going, man. <laughs> so let's shift over to your last meal. I was gonna say, go ahead, make that segue. I know, I know, right? <laughs> I'm a professional. <laughs> yeah, I can go from cats to food. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what would your last meal be? Uh, you know, I, after giving much much thought, here's the thing. I have to. There's a caveat that goes along with this, right? First of all is that I'm vegan. And I'm not vegan because I'm a healthy human being. I am now because I'm vegan, but that wasn't the choice. I did it for the animals. And so before I went vegan, there was a whole slew of things that I loved. I'm a New York Jew, man. There's there's a lot that goes with that. Uh, Those and, are my people. Yes. Yeah, my mom's a New York Jew. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I, and I'm, I'm just a Jew. I'm just... <laughs> 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 I, I just that's the best line ever um but yeah no upper west side new yorker and um and i grew up across the street from zabar's which is the, oh, literally across the street across the street oh, like the so guys lucky. at zabar's knew my mom better than they knew their own boss that's right? amazing yeah so that's what i grew up with and and there was and for that... people listening who don't know zabar's is an amazing jewish fish counter in delhi <sighs> bagels yeah. Bagels and cream cheese and lox. Oh, my. Oh, boy. We're getting to the point where vegan cream cheese, I couldn't tell tell it apart. Really? Uh What brand do you like? The best one is called Kite Hill. Kite Kite Hill cream cheese at the Chive cream cheese is the end of the world for me. I've oh. only had the Tofuti. Oh, yeah, but it's okay. Uh, it's, okay. It's, okay. it's okay. Kite Hill is the bomb. Vegan A's. I'm sorry, you can't tell it apart. I agree. I actually think it's a little better than mayonnaise. I agree. Yeah, yeah. it's good. So yeah, so there's there's all that. But but if it was a last meal, I, I would I would be hard pressed not to say, you know, at least a version that I could karmically live with 
Um, Vegan gefilte. Exactly. <laughs> That has to be easy because gefilte fish is so unnatural to begin with. That's true. It's a, it's a football of fish. It's There's got to be some way of making it. Now, here's the thing, though. I mean, we are only a few years away from clean meat and clean meat, you know, lab-raised meat. Right now, that <laughs> plate of lox would probably be $40,000. Yeah. But by 2021, we're going to have it, and it's going to be competitive. Now, lox, I don't know. But the street food. And listen, I was a hot dog guy, dirty water hot dog, man. I that is New York. It is New York, yeah. and it's amazing, and I know it's gross as hell, but that's what I grew up on was that. So I think I would have sort of a like this whole smorgasbord of like New York street and Jewish food, and, I would, and I'd be happy. Okay. Pickles out of a barrel. Lower East Side, when I was growing up, my dad would take me down to Lower East Side. That's my thing. I think a lot of this is part of the aesthetic because I love Russ and Daughters in the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. And part of it is going in and it's the old black and white checkered floor. Yep. And then everyone's wearing their little hat. And it's yeah. an experience and it feels like you're walking into a different decade. Exactly. And it's been open 100 years and it feels the same. You imagine it would be pretty much the same as it was back then. Except same with Katz's Deli. When would you get Zabar's Jewish holidays and stuff? Was this like a Shabbat thing or was it just all the damn time? It was all the damn time. Okay. It was, the answer is yes. We, we lived <laughs> in, in, in Zabar's. But when we were talking about the sentimentality of it, you know, breaking the Yom Kippur fast is one of those things in Jewish culture. And it's funny because, you know, we come in all stripes. And But, you know, when we were growing up, they would call us the, the Upper West Side liberal Jewish community. It's like submarine Jews where it's like hmm. you come up for Yom Kippur and you go back down again. Yes. You come up for Hanukkah yes. and you're down again. We're you know? reformed Jews. That's what we do. That's what we do. We're in it so for the bagels. It's about, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's a cultural thing you wouldn't understand. And that's exactly how the breaking of the fast is, where it's the same thing every year. But you're starving. You haven't eaten in 24 hours. So the smell of the bagels and the scrambled eggs and, and whatever else, it just permeates the house. And for once, the entire family is really happy. You know, because they're really hungry and they get to eat. Yeah. I always laugh thinking about, you know, Ramadan is a month long and they yeah. fast every day. And Jews are just like, I didn't eat all day. I didn't. I didn't eat all day. Like one day out of the whole year. I wasn't able to turn on the TV. It was dark in the house. No water. I know. It was yeah. terrible. Terrible. Yeah. No Shabbos goy to help me. <laughs> Jackson Galaxy wants Jewish delicacies from Zabar's. A big, famous 83-year-old specialty and kosher market in Manhattan that is still run by the Zabar family. And Zabar's is pretty lucky to still be open, considering how many Jewish delis have shuttered in this country. Can you imagine a life without bagels? A life without pickles? Well, you can probably still get those at the grocery store, but not the good sour ones. A life without five feet of pastrami held together with two tiny pieces of bread. When we come back, we will discuss the fall of the Jewish deli. It's happening out there. In 2016, Manhattan's Carnegie Deli closed after 79 years in business. And this news was as sour as the pickles served alongside their mile-high pastrami sandwiches. But Carnegie Deli is just a drop in a bucket. It's just a name that everybody knows. There are countless delis that have closed over the years. David Sachs wrote the book, Save the Deli. And he gives me the breakdown on exactly how many delis we have left. The the best record that was found was that, you know, in, in 19... 31 or 32, there was something like 1,500 kosher delicatessens in New York City in the five boroughs of New York alone, right? So if you extrapolate that out to the number of non-kosher delis that were there, um, you're talking about a couple more thousand, plus all the Jewish delicatessens that existed in other communities around not just North America, the world, um, you know, hundreds in, you know, possibly in a city like Chicago, um, in cities like Los Angeles and and Philadelphia and Baltimore um, and even somewhere like Seattle. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, today there's really just a couple hundred around the world. Uh, and, and in the big cities like New York, I mean, we're talking about, you know, a few dozen, which once again is, you know, a fraction of a percentage of what it was at its peak. Out here in Seattle, there's kind of no such thing as a Jewish deli. It is a sad scene. There used to be a place called I Heart New York Deli. And when I first tried this guy's, it was just one guy that ran the place. It was a little stand in Pike Place Market. And when I first tried his matzo ball soup, I almost died. Uh, forgive the 
caricature of an old Jewish grandmother accent, but it was the only time I've ever tasted matzo ball soup in a restaurant that tasted exactly like my mom's. So now that they're shuttered, if I want matzo ball soup, I make it myself. It's still good. I I will give you a little secret. My mom's two special tips for matzo ball soup is adding fresh dill and parsnips. But it is really hard to find a corned beef sandwich like you'd get at Katz's or Cantor's. So I asked David why the delis are closing. You know, listen, the restaurant business is a difficult business. The restaurant that's a couple decades old is a rare thing regardless of what type of cuisine it is. Uh, But the Jewish delicatessen faces certain challenges that are unique to it from, you know, a cultural perspective and also a culinary perspective. The heart of the problem is, is an economic one. You know, Jewish delicatessens exist to serve Jewish deli sandwiches, which is, you know, two slices of bread and a big old pile of salted, cured, smoked meat, pastrami, corned beef, Montreal smoked meat, tongue, whatever you want to have. You know, there's no lettuce, there's no tomatoes, there's no condiments in there. And so, you know, that sandwich is one of the most (coughs) expensive menu items you could serve everyone. But because it's a sandwich, they expect it to be cheap. So if someone serves you a deli sandwich that's over, you know, $10, $12, you say highway robbery, whereas you would pay $15 for a bowl of pasta. Um, But the bowl of pasta is going to net much more profit to the restaurant that's serving it than that deli sandwich where the owner might scrape by a dollar, maybe even a few cents uh, of profit on that sandwich. And that sandwich is the literal bread and butter of the deli business. And so it's it's increasingly difficult as meat prices rise, as once cheap cuts like brisket have become more expensive or even tongue um, because other cultures have discovered them and, and brisket with Texas barbecue has become a massive thing all over the U.S. The price of it skyrocketed over the past couple of decades. It becomes increasingly difficult for the deli to turn a profit. And there's only so many French fries and, you know, sodas and bowls of matzo ball soup that they can sell in order to to make up for that. I was complaining to David that I've been to some Jewish delis that serve BLTs and bacon and eggs, and I'm not kosher, but it just kind of seems wrong. And he actually defended the delis. He said Jewish delis have had to expand their menus to appeal to a broader audience than just Jews. Restaurants, all restaurants need to appeal to as broad an audience as possible. And so many delis for many years went down the road of opening their menus, let's say, to all sorts of different things. But there were ones where you could get spaghetti and meatballs and lobster and chow mein in an attempt to kind of please everyone. And often what that did was it watered down the core product and the core food, which was, you know, those those classic deli dishes. What's interesting is that when you see the new generation of delis opening up and are succeeding in cities like San Francisco and D.C. and and, and New York, uh, they're often very focused on that core of, of deli products. You know, I think of uh, Kenny and Zook's in Portland, which is a very successful new school Jewish deli. And again, they're not trying to reinvent the wheel. They're just going back to the delicious basics. I think it kind of does fit in, though, with the hipster sensibilities of everything being craft and artisan, because, you know, if you're going to make a bagel, like you have to work on that. And if you're going to do this smoked meat and if you're going to do lox, anything like that, preserving things and salting, like these are all kind of trendy right now. Yeah, and, and it fits in very much with the culinary trend today. Um, and, and I think that's it. At its core, you know, when it works best, it's it's simplicity done right, which is not a simple thing to do. So let's talk about the history. Um, who started the deli culture in America? And it was really in the 1880s when persecution in Tsarist Russia drove more than a million uh, Eastern European Jews from all over Eastern Europe to immigrate to the United States. And this huge influx of immigrants, as we've seen with other influx of of immigrant groups um, that's going on until today, brought with them their foods and their tastes and their traditions. And they opened businesses, uh, small butcher shops, um, small takeout restaurants to serve their communities, which eventually became more Americanized, more in tune with the way people were eating in this country, and really evolved into you know the, the deli that we recognize today. Was there a particular country, like a particular, like was it the Romanians? Who was it who was um, doing deli in New York? 
Well, all Eastern European Jews were doing it. Different cities have different demographics. So Toronto, where I'm from, is a much more heavily Polish city, somewhere like New York or Montreal, which is much more Romanian. And that's reflected in the flavors of the deli. We're, we lean more toward corned beef and sort of sweeter baked goods, where the Romanians uh, have this tradition of spice and smoking and, and very peppery things. And that's how you get pastrami or Montreal smoked meat. So sometimes when I do an interview, the very best stuff comes when the microphone is off, which is so frustrating. You end up having these conversations near the door when you're saying goodbye to people and you're like, ah, why didn't you say this when you were in the studio? Uh, and the sad part is, is that you miss out on these amazing conversations, listeners. So I'm going to bring one of the conversations Jackson Galaxy and I had off mic back to life on this show. When we come back, I chat with the CEO of Beyond Meat, a plant-based burger that bleeds. Like many of our guests on your last meal, Jackson Galaxy is a vegan, but he still misses foods that he loved from his childhood like lox, which he was talking about earlier. And in his quest to find the best vegan versions of his favorite foods, he discovered something called the Beyond Burger. The Beyond Burger is completely plant-based, but the texture is like ground beef. The flavor is like ground beef. And when you cut into this burger, it bleeds like a rare burger would, which, as you can imagine, would be off-putting to a lot of vegetarians and vegans who are trying to get far, far away from meat. But this burger is actually supposed to appeal to meat eaters to get them eating more plant-based foods, which is more sustainable and better for the environment. Beyond Meat's CEO, Ethan Brown, isn't interested in making veggie burgers or black bean burgers. He has a team of scientists trying to emulate meat with plants. And so we start with the composition of meat, and we understand it to be basically five things. It's, a, it's amino acids, it's lipids, it's almost no carbohydrates, there's a trace amount of carbohydrates, and there's trace minerals, and there's predominantly water. Meat is almost 60 to 70 percent uh, water. And so we then look at the architecture of meat, and how are those five elements put together? You know, through whether it's academic textbooks uh, from meat science departments or our own work in putting a piece of meat under an MRI, for example, or other, other imaging equipment, we can understand the architecture of meat. So what we're doing is taking those five core pieces and we're taking them from non-animal sources. We're taking them from primarily from the plant kingdom. And we're taking the protein, the fat, and water, and we're assembling it in the architecture of meat. We are essentially providing a piece of meat, but just meat that's bypassed the animal and come directly from plants. What kind of plants replicate these qualities, especially I'm interested in what replicates fat? We use peas. We use a, a particular type of yellow pea. We are beginning to use uh, fava bean, uh, rice protein, and there's just a, you know, literally thousands of different feedstocks that we can use to draw protein from. But some of the ones that are, that, that are on our hit list are kind of like lupin, camelina, mustard seed, all of these uh, have great sources of amino acids, and so it's just finding crops that have a high concentration of amino acids in them and then extracting those. And, and so that's the, uh, the work we're doing on the protein side. On the fat side, we rely now on coconut fat quite a bit. So I think the most salacious component of what you've created is that I've heard and read that when you take a bite of this burger, it bleeds just like real meat. Obviously, there's no blood, so what are you using to simulate that experience? Right. No, that's a neat part of the of the product. And so, you know, we had to make a decision several years back. How do we go about providing the consumer with basically what is interstitial fluid or blood? There's two ways we could do it. One was to, to genetically modify to create a, a blood-like substance. Um, and we said, we're not going to do that because we don't want to run up against those headwinds. Everything we use is natural. I think the, the scientists, when we had this discussion, were very interested in, in potentially using a uh, GMO approach because it would be easier, right? But we said, no, you have to do this in a way that someone can explain to their family what the core ingredients are. And so that gave them some more challenges, but they worked through it. And in this case, it's something very simple. They said, let's use beet juice. <laughs> and that's what it is. So why was it important for you to replicate meat instead of doing what everyone else is doing, like a black bean burger or, you know, a veggie burger? No, it's a great question. And that's a question my mother asks me all the time. <laughs> She's like, why are you so focused on making this, you know, just like animal protein? 
because we believe that, you know, as a species, we're very covetous of, of, of animal protein and meat. Um, it's something that uh, plays a large role in our, our heritage and our background. And we evolved consuming meat, increasing amounts of meat as we became more and more capable as hunters and, and as, our, as our cultures grew. So, you know, I don't see a day when uh, consumers are not going to be consuming meat, but I, I very clearly see a day when consumers will be consuming meat that comes from plants uh, in increasing percentages to the point where, you know, you may no longer need the animal to, to create meat. Um, and so you're not going to get that if you're just serving, you know, quinoa and bean burgers. Totally. Would you say then, I mean, I'm sure your product, you want everybody to eat it, but is this more designed for meat eaters then, for them to back off the meat because vegetarians are already not eating it? Correct. Yeah, this is for people who love meat, love the meat experience, want to celebrate you know, all the traditions around meat, whether it's barbecue or, or Thanksgiving, etc. You know, an analogy is, you know, I'm talking to you on a landline, but that's increasingly rare. Uh, you know, most of the calls that I take now are on, on my mobile phone. I don't call it a fake phone. I don't call it, you know, um, alternative phone. <laughs> it's, it's a phone, but it is a different phone, and it's a new type of phone. But because so many of these manufacturers, uh, Apple, et cetera, have made it better than a landline, people flock to it, right? And so our job as a, a, a group of innovators is to not preach or browbeat or ask people to sacrifice, but it's to make products that are better than the animal protein equivalent, whether it's the nutritional value we're delivering, uh, how people feel after they've consumed it. Uh, all of these things are what we focus on. And if we get the product right, the rest will work itself out. And we've seen that with the Beyond Burger. You know, we don't market much, right? It's, it, it's something that satisfies, I think, a latent demand that's in the public for people want to continue to consume meat, um, but increasingly concerned about whether it's the health effects or the environmental implications or animal welfare. So this provides a, an approach that, that allows them to essentially have their cake and eat it too. In my opinion, one of the coolest things about Beyond Meat and the Beyond Burger is that Ethan founded the company in the name of helping planet Earth. It wasn't just a business venture. It's something that had been nagging at him for a long time. When he was a kid, he spent a lot of time on his family's farm. And so I got exposed to animal agriculture early and, and just really, I wanted to be a vet when I was a kid. I loved animals and went from that to get into the alternative energy field as a professional. Worked on fuel cells for a very long time because I felt that was important for, for climate change. But I didn't feel like it was striking at the core of what I care the most about. So if you look at really what's driving the emissions on the climate front, it's not necessarily just transportation, right? In fact, it's predominantly livestock. And so that was the really big eye-opening moment for me to realize that, that the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions was, in fact, livestock. So if that's something I cared so deeply about, I need to work on the right problem. So I asked a simple question, which was, do you need an animal to, to create a piece of meat? And after doing a lot of research, I realized you don't need one. And so I started to work on that and connected with some academics who were doing terrific work on this at the University of Missouri and started the company. Ethan has top scientists on the case of making burgers, many who came from cancer research. And he says that the product is constantly changing and improving. And he says it will probably be a completely different burger in a couple of years. He hopes it will be as they come up with new ways to make Beyond Meat's taste and feel more like real meat. And that was Jackson Galaxy's last meal. How many cat tattoos do you have? I think they're all cat tattoos. I mean, I'm sleeve from collarbone to wrist and... I would say it's got to be at least 20. From Panthers to, I've got the Pink Panther on this side. Ooh. Oh, here, look, you can see Valoria, my 24-year-old. There she is. Oh, she's pretty. Right? Well, I love the whiskers. Tattoo. He's talking about his 24-year-old cat, for the record. You can catch Jackson Galaxy on Animal Planet's My Cat from Hell. And for the dog people out there, he has a new show coming out this fall. It's called Cat Meets Dog. He also has a book coming out on Halloween called Total Cat Mojo. <laughs> I don't know why. That's funny. It's a funny, it's a funny title. Okay. <laughs> Thanks to David Sachs, author of Save the Deli, and Ethan Brown, CEO of Beyond Meat, which is available at Safeways and Whole Foods across the country. And you can try a burger at BurgerFi and Veggie Grill restaurants. This episode is produced by Aaron Mason and me, theme music by Prom Queen. You can find me on Twitter at I'm Rachel Bell, on Facebook at backslash Hello Rachel Bell. And please subscribe. We don't want to be desperate or anything, but it does help keep the show afloat. If you don't want your last meal to go the way of the Jewish deli, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes. I'm Rachel Bell, and this 
is your last meal. Ah, it's good radio. Hmm. <laughs> There's our blooper.